right, cool. Sounds good. Looks like we're all set. Cool. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, like I mentioned, I'm Sean O'Connor. I manage the backend engineering team at Bitly. Um, we're talking about uh, some lessons learned in uh, recent data center migration that we went through, uh, just because that's a somewhat rare but uh, interesting exercise. Before I get into that, though, it's something I usually uh, tends to come up with this. Uh, who here has heard of or used Bitly? Awesome, cool, almost everybody. Uh, who here has any idea how we make any money or have a business that, you know, is more than two people? Cool, more hands than usual, but still. Uh, so the real quick history there is, so Bitly was created back in 2008 uh, to solve a really simple user experience problem uh, if you wanted to short share links on Twitter, but they needed to be short to pin the character limit. So it was created, and right away we saw people were using BitLinks in ways that we didn't expect. We weren't quite sure why, so we dug into it, and we came to understand that people were using uh, short links or bit links in places where uh, the length didn't matter because what they did care about was the metrics, right? Being able to get visibility into activity in all kinds of places where previously they had no visibility, right? Um, so from there, <coughs> we've kind of built out a link management platform that allows users to uh, understand and control user experience across the web, right? Cr try and create an internet you can see across. <clears throat> and the idea is, you know, on all, today, you know, people are having links going on all kinds of places, right? It can be in social, it could be uh, over different platforms, it can be in the physical world, right? How many slides have had Bitly links here? Uh, by the way, thank you for that. <laughs> um, right, so you want to have understanding of what's going on there. Additionally, uh, traditionally, you know, you can get some data from Twitter, you can get some data from Facebook, but it's comparing apples and oranges. It's really hard to compare across these data silos. Help you out with that. And uh, it also helps be able to share things across teams and organization. Um, we do it all through links, right? Links can go everywhere. Uh, so having links that you can have some control over and that you can have some visibility into is pretty powerful. Turns out people kind of like this. Uh, so every month we see about 300 million shortens. Uh, and on that we see about 9 billion clicks from 400, uh, excuse me, 4 billion um, unique, billion, ugh, unique browsers. Um, so it's a scale where lots of things get interesting. And particularly, uh, it also means that you know, if uh, things go down, uh, a few people are going to notice and be kind of upset. So uh, it's a thing to pay attention to. So one of the things that made it interesting was doing a data center move, doing a great migration. Uh, for us, this was Project Attenborough. Uh, it largely happened in 2015. Um, and in the course of this project, we moved about 220 chassis, uh, dozens of live microservices, hundreds of terabytes of data, all while handling tens of thousands of requests per second. Uh, in a live production environment. We did it all in about six months with five engineers and zero downtime. Um, and while I'd love to get into like the nitty gritty and give you like the play by play of how that's gonna work or how that happened, uh, we don't quite have time for that. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on a lot of the lessons learned from that exercise and what kind of the, the higher level takeaways for us uh, were and kind of how we made it through without having the entire team rage quit uh, or breaking you know, our little core in the internet. Um, and as we go through this, you'll see kind of three main three themes really come up over and over and over again, right? Foc having, figure out what your priorities are and using those as, as focus. Doing your homework and being honest, especially with yourself, right? There's all kinds of situations where you'll be trunched for time, you'll be having all these kinds of things that you want, and it'll be really easy to kind of trick yourself into uh, believing things that are not actually going to be true or helpful, and it's critical that you're going to be honest in that. So with that, uh, being said, got to start at the beginning. And the beginning of this kind of thing is just deciding to actually do the move, right? Uh, data center, doing a data center move is something that is time consuming and expensive and risky and distracting, right? It is almost certainly not the thing you want your business to be doing. Uh, but sometimes circumstances will happen where it becomes necessary or, or uh, desirable. And so it's incredibly important for you to really figure out why exactly you're doing this, right? First, Figure out if you need to. Easiest way to do a data center move is to just not do it, <laughs> right? But if you, if you do have to do one, um, understanding why you're doing it is important, right? And both is important for making that decision, and it's also going to be lighting your way throughout the entire process, right? So it's critical to figure out what your priorities are and what's the most important things for you, right? Uh, <coughs> paraphrase, I think Merlin Mann, who may have himself been paraphrasing somebody else, uh, right, if you have multiple first priorities, you, you don't have any priorities, right? So you gotta be really clear uh, and, and uh, focused on this. 
Um, it's going to be different for everybody, and it's going to be different in every move, right? For us in particular, was we had to we had to have zero downtime, right? We can't break the internet. Uh, we had to we had a hard cutoff on our old data center, so we had to hit our schedule, uh, and we had to set up a good foundation for kind of our new home, right? We knew we there was all kinds of things we knew we wanted to do, but wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to do, given our timeline. But we needed to make sure that at least the foundation was solid. For you, that could be completely different, right? It all depends on the needs of your business needs your team, and what you have available. So to figure out your priorities, it's time to go out and look at the options for vendors, right? Uh, and like you all know, like, you know, the big, big ones like Amazon and Google, but like when you get into this, like there's just so many different vendors have all kinds of different offerings. Um, and so when you start looking at this, you gotta kind of start narrowing down, right, to figure out what vendors are more suited for you. First pass, you can usually just use your priorities to get like a high level thing of just understanding like, well, that just probably fundamentally won't work for us. Uh, and then from there, it's time to do some homework, right? You gotta go do a whole bunch of due diligence. And one of the first bits of due diligence that you really gotta do is you need to make sure that you actually know how all your existing systems work. And while that sounds like a silly statement to say, because like, of course I know how my systems work, how many of you have some service or system sitting in a corner that uh, nobody who still works at your company has actually touched? Yeah, you know, nobody's putting your hands up. I know, I know it's out there. Um, right, so that, like, that's the thing you have to understand before, right, you have to know how that works before you can move it. Beyond that, for, even for the things you are familiar with, you have to make sure you know what the current capacity and performance bottlenecks for those systems are, right, because um, when you're trying to understand what that system might look like in a new environment, you really gotta understand what the exact characteristics of that system are to kind of model that out. Uh, additionally, you identify any particular like specialized needs you might have that you're going to have to really vet with potential vendors. Uh, some examples for us is like we know we have to do layer four DDoS protection. A lot of times vendors want to do layer seven, uh, so that knocked out a lot of things. We knew we had a break. We have our own slash 24 uh, IPv4 block, so we knew we had to bring that. That adds some complications, and we have some core systems that were designed for kind of the cost performance ratios of spitting Rust hard drives. And that's another thing that we had to make sure that we understood and figured out, right? Again, for you, these are going to be different, but identifying those is the critical work. Um, so once you get those, um, then you need to talk with your vendors, understand how their platforms are going to work, and uh, do kind of come up with a cost model. So you understand how, how is your service going to cost in their platform, how your system is going to work, how is that all going to lay out, right? And this is initially going to be a, like a high level of detail and just keep on iterating down. Um, and from there, uh, you also need to start understanding where are the limits and boundaries of a given provider, right? When you try and spin up the 200th server, are you going to be filling up the pond and then, like, be SOL and getting more servers? It's probably not something you want to figure out mid-move, right? Um, so trying to identify that stuff. Um, and understand what the kind of finer grain trade-offs are for cost-performance stuff for given vendors. Um, even within a given category, these can be surprisingly different across vendors. So, like, even though... AWS and GCP and Azure all have, at a high level, similar offerings. The way that your particular services might end up costing on those different platforms can be substantially different. So you need to make sure you do the due diligence with each vendor you kind of are looking at seriously. As part of this, I'd give a bit of a warning that uh, if you don't know how something's going to work, and the vendor and or yourself are just going, ah, we'll figure it out when we start moving. Uh, Take that as a warning sign, <laughs> right? We've had we had a bunch of times where you know we'd be talking to like the sales guy from a vendor, like, oh yeah, no, we can definitely do that, but we we knew it was a bit going to be like a high risk area for us, and we pushed and um, got to you know be in the room with like a networking folks, and then got into the DS, and like, oh yeah, no, we just can't do that, right? Um, and if we got to that point after we signed the contract, that was going to be a lot worse, right? <laughs> so make sure that you know, kind of know that you can actually do everything that you need to do. Um, the last bit of diligence that you need before you can actually do the move is then figure out um, what your dependencies are, particularly from the vendor, right? We'll get into some how you handle your internal dependencies. Um, but your vendor dependencies is stuff like uh, what are the timelines for different things, right? How long does it take them to spin up servers? How long um, does it take to get networking changes done? Um, does legal need to get involved at any point in the process? How long does that take, right? Because these are all things that can really add up. If you go in assuming that, like, oh, I can just spin up servers uh, and they'll be ready the next day, and it turns out it takes a week to spin up servers, your timeline just really changed, right? 
Um, so you really need to make sure you have all that information coming up front. Um, and yeah, so it'll be good. So you got all that due diligence out of the way. You've been honest with yourself and with your vendors. Uh, you're kind of focusing on your priorities. So it's time to you know pull up the truck, start moving. Uh, and then you realize, like, uh, maybe not everything here needs to actually come along with us in the move, right? Just like when, you know, you're moving apartments uh, or moving houses, right? Uh, a lot of times the easiest way to move stuff is to throw stuff out, right? If you have services, you know, if your, your company's been around for a while, like Bitly's been around for eight, nine years now, uh, there's things that we built that just didn't pan out, that we've been meaning to kill for some time, uh, but just haven't done the work to do it. Um, I would strongly recommend that you uh, take a good hard look at kind of what your product has and see if there is anything that you can just shut down that you've been meaning to shut down or that isn't getting the usage that you want and might be make sense to shut down instead of moving across data centers. It's way easier just to spin something down and clean it up than to try and move it to a new environment. Um, so once you get that cleanup done, right, <coughs> uh, you end up kind of in a place just like uh, when you're moving again where you just see this giant pile of boxes like, oh, Jesus, how are we going to, that looks like a lot of work. How are we going to even take this on, right? Um, and the, the answer basically boils down to the same basic problem solving you know, that we use as, as engineers every day is you break it down into smaller problems, right? You can't, un unless you have a very small, simple application, you almost certainly can't just move it wholesale, right? You're going to have to have lots of smaller pr problems that you've got to take on and work through. Uh, taking that a step further, I would strongly recommend that you find ways to actually break down the move itself into lots of smaller moves, right? Kind of think about it as, as much as possible like a bucket brigade, right? If, if you imagine five people carrying a giant bucket of water versus five people continually passing smaller buckets of water, the bucket brigade is always going to be more efficient, more effective, and safer. Um, this is the same, same kind of thing, right? We ended up breaking down our move into dozens of tiny, small system and service transitions. And this buys you a lot. Um, and you kind of think about, like, the lot of, there's a lot of parallels here to, like, doing continuous deployment or continuous integration, right? Um, by doing lots of small moves, your service area for risk is way smaller, and it moves any kind of failures from a place where it's a catastrophe to where it's just a learning opportunity. Um, additionally, it gives you a lot of flexibility in uh, letting you, or it gives you a lot of ways to learn incrementally and then improve your process as you go along, right? So you can start, you can start by just moving low-risk systems, low-priority systems, where if they went away for a few days, not the end of the world. Um, and that lets you, you know, get the words through the pipes, understand what your new environment's like, identify flaws in your process. Um, but then also lets you w find ways to start uh, pecking away at, like, however much due diligence you do, there'll be places where you just know that there's some unknown unknowns, right? They'll just be scary over there, and you know like they'll be keeping, up you, up, keeping you up at night. Um, so <laughs> by breaking things down into smaller moves, you're able to start getting information about those areas, right? And do things to understand those unknowns, uh, identify and reduce the places for unknowns to hide uh, without necessarily doing the whole cutover all at once. So that's cool. So we broke down the problem, figured out how we could do lots of small moves. Uh, from there, we start you know, working out uh, the dependencies kind of internal in our services, right? And systems, right? Uh, the time when you figure out that service A depends on service B really shouldn't be when you're starting to like move, trying to stand up service A in the new data center. Uh, really doesn't go well. <laughs> um, so it's really critical that you figure out these dependencies up front just for the obvious reasons of uh, just making sure things work. Going beyond that, though, I'd encourage you to be aggressive about uh, seeing how creative you can be about decomposing those dependencies or reordering the way you do things to take advantage of how your dependencies work out. Um, there's a natural tendency to kind of just do like a really just straight flat line, like I do this, and like flat single sequence uh, approach to this. And like if you can do that, that might be fine. But a lot of times if you kind of put some work into it and maybe look at things in some uncomfortable ways. You can identify places where you're like, oh, well, actually, if we just do move this over here and this over here, it's not the way I was thinking about doing it, but that actually lets us then get away with a one less dependency and paralyze some stuff. Um, and even if uh, you maybe, let's say, only have three people on your team, finding more places where you potentially can paralyze work, even if you don't have the resources to do it all at once, 
uh, gets you more options and flexibility as you execute, which is always going to be something you'll be thankful for. Uh, but while you're doing this, also remember your priorities, right? If, um, you know, if, if do it, you need to do a ton of work to decompose a, a dependency when, like, you, your original timeline was going to be fine without getting rid of that dependency, maybe that wasn't worth the work. Um, but maybe that buys you something else that's important for your priorities. So keep that in mind. A related uh, bit of advice uh, that I put out there to the, for this is uh, if there are any opportunities you can find for running systems in parallel between your old and new environments, absolutely do that. Um, it's a great way to both eliminate a lot of dependencies, potentially, or simplify a lot of dependencies. It also lets you get a lot of confidence in new systems before cutting things over, right? It's a lot less scary to do a big cutover when you're already effectively doing your production write volume in both environments than when everything's going over at once. Um, for us in particular, this was fairly easy for a lot of systems in that a lot of our, we have a kind of SOA set up, right, microservices, and a lot of our systems, uh, all their system state changes come in through asynchronous queues, so it was fairly easy for us to just stand up a new copy, get a new copy of the stream, and go for that. Obviously, depending on your environment, it may or may not be that easy, but as much as you can find ways to do this, it's a, it's a big win. So, uh, you know, you've done all your homework, you kind of figure out your priorities of your move, figured out your dependencies, figured out things you might be able to run in parallel, time to actually get into the work, right? And when you're executing it, you're going to have two really big friends, automation, and checklists, right? Um, <laughs> clearly, I mean, that, that's what my DevOps automation looks like. I don't know about yours. Um, but so these are really critical, uh, just like any kind of traditional DevOps operation, is these are critical just in that uh, I can review a script, I can revise a script, I can rehearse a script, I can um, repeat a script or a checklist. I can't do any of that with the stuff in your brain, right? I can't run unit tests on your brain. I can't do code review or give feedback on what's in your brain. Uh, so having everything written out like this gets huge, just huge benefits of having more eyes on it and uh, relying on things that are good at doing things repeatedly consistently, aka computers and not humans. Um, additionally, it has a nice side benefit of um, cutovers are really complicated high stress scenarios, right? So the less you have to actively think about just the actual act of doing the thing, the more brain power and the more attention you have to devote to um, things that aren't that, right? So keeping an eye and understanding that what's, what's going on, what might be going wrong, what might be going well, and how to deal with anything going wrong, right? If you're already bugging out just executing something, when something goes wrong, you're already going to be in a bad place. But if you're working off a checklist, you'll be good. Uh, a related thing that comes with this is identifying patterns and leveraging those, right? So again, uh, lazy engineers are good engineers. Uh, so when you start seeing that, like, oh, these actually six these might be the six services, all effectively need to follow the same pattern for the move. Take advantage of that, right? That means they can have common tooling, easier automation, um, less room for mistakes. Um, look for that, right? And place to do homework. So identifying and executing these patterns. Uh, but be honest, right? Like you can fall into the trap of like you know uh, uh, architecture astronaut type stuff, right? Of just like engineering a giant crazy system to do your move when really just like a checklist would have been fine, right? So be honest about that. Um, think about places where you can have safeguards and options and rollback plans. Always, it's always great if you can roll back, but it's not always possible when you can't roll back. Think about visibility and options, right? If something goes wrong, how are you going to know that it's gone wrong? So if something's gone wrong, how do you know what's gone wrong, right? Anything you can do to get ready and provide that visibility before you start is going to get you a lot. So you know, uh, think through ways that things could fail and do whatever you can to prep options for when that happens. The more you can kind of prep up front like this, uh, the happier it will be when things go wrong. Related to things going wrong, uh, it'll happen. <laughs> I guarantee you plan A is not going to be how, how you actually end up doing everything. Um, so when something does go wrong, the important thing to keep in mind is you need to roll with the punches, right? Um, by that, what I mean is be honest, like, when something goes wrong, figure out why it went wrong, right? Do the work to understand that. And then be honest about the impact of that and use your priorities to adjust your plans accordingly, right? At this point, right, once something's gone wrong, your old plan doesn't matter anymore. What matters now is what's left to do, the current state of reality, or at least your understanding of it, 
uh, and what options you have ahead of you. Focus on that, you'll be fine. Uh, and the last bit to keep in mind is your team, right? Depending on how you do things, uh, they might look like this happy, wonderful little pup over on the left, or they might look like the poor exhausted guy on the right here. Um, and the way you manage this is to regularly square kind of your progress, your plans, and your priorities against where, how, how things are going, doing that regularly, and being honest about um, the state of your team, where you stand, and what you have to do, right? This is going to be one of those areas where you will want to do 10x more than you ever possibly can, right? This is the, the inherently, these projects are, you'll come along like, oh, this would be a great time to adopt x, adopt y. Um, but you got to be strict about what you actually can accomplish so you don't have your entire team rage quit in a month, right? Um, so that's about it. Um, eventually, you will have a big scary cutover where you got to hit a button and do like the final thing that cuts over the last few things. Uh, it's always going to be terrifying. It's probably going to be in the middle of the night. You're going to be tired. But if you've focused on your priorities, you've done your homework, and you've been honest, it'll be OK. If not, uh, best of luck. <laughs> And thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Sean. That was great advice. I want to thank um, Corey, Matt, and Steve, as well as Sean, for coming in and uh, participating in this track uh, where Apps Meet Deploy. We hope you found this information useful. There is another track coming in up in this room at 4 o'clock, so uh, check your brochures and see if those uh, sessions interest you and, and come on back, or check out what's in the classroom, or in the learning hack, or excuse me, the mini hacks and learning labs, or in the workshops. So there's quite a bit of stuff going on, and uh, check it all out. Thanks so much for coming.